Okay, and I think we're recording. So, okay, everybody, uh, we'll get started. So, again, my name is Aaron Esri, uh, Extension ex Assistant Extension Specialist for Viticulture and Ology at Oklahoma State. And this presentation is over just, you know, basic winemaking 101. So, here we go. So, I'll start with harvest. Um, if you're going to make wine, you have to know when to harvest. And these numbers I uh, have here are, you know, excellent by the book numbers for first and foremost bricks. Uh, in winemaking, we use bricks. Bricks is sugars, soluble solids. You would like your bricks to be somewhere between 23 or 28. Um, your pH is also very important at harvest. For red wine, you want between 3, 4, 3, 8. For white wine, 3, 2 to 3, 5. And then your titratable acidity, um, that's something that should be measured. Not a lot of people do measure it, but if you can measure it, it's another great you know, number to have. Uh, for reds, somewhere between four to six, and in whites, three and a half to eight. Now, this is in a perfect world, and growing grapes, it's actually very hard to get all of these numbers within those ranges at one time. It, it, it is difficult because when, when bricks go up, pH usually goes up, you know, and titratable acidity goes down. So it's, it's hard to get in these numbers per se, but if you can, you're in great shape. Um, now, with that being said, if you have a vineyard, you need to own a refractometer and a pH meter. Like those are two tools you need to have at planting. Uh, the refractometer measures sugars, which is bricks, and then the pH meter is for pH. This little tool in the top right corner is, is, a, is called a Venmetrica. And it's, it's great for measuring pH TA, and it will even measure your free SO2 when you, when you go to make wine. Um, it doesn't measure sugar though, so you have to get a refractometer. But if you wanted to invest in a Venmetrica, that's a, that's a great, great tool to have. Okay, so we've harvested. We're gonna crush, to stem, and press. As, as I'm sure you know, again, just the basics though, when you have red grapes, you wanna crush them and to stem them, ferment the must, which is skins and juice and seeds all together. When you're making white wine though, you press first. So you, you remove the skins and seeds entirely and you just have the juice and you ferment the juice. And that's what makes white wine white is because there's no skin contact. There's no color extraction, okay? Fermentation. So for red must, and must is skins with seeds and juice, you know. So for red must, fermentation should last around a week um, and be between 77 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're able to control temperature, that's, that's about where you want it. Uh, for white wine, you want it colder. You want it about 20 degrees colder, um, or, or somewhere in the 60s at least. Um, but again, I, I've worked at wineries that do no fermentation control temperature. They, they just ferment in room temperature as is, and that's fine too. It's, it's not wrong or right, but if you can control your temperature, these are the numbers where you, where you usually wanna be on depressing. So again, if you have red wine, you press after fermentation. If you're making white or rosé, you press prior to fermentation. Tartaric acid. So this is, we'll, we'll get more and more advanced as it goes on, but still. So acid addition should be made at fermentation. That's, that's the best time to make a tartaric acid addition. You can still make acid additions later, it's just, you know, it's no wrong or right. It's just usually just better. Um, and every winery I've worked at, we've all we've always made additions later to like, we make additions at fermentation, but then it's like months later, okay, we need some acid. So you make acid additions later. That's no problem, but it's usually better to do it up front. Racking. This is something that I don't know if people do, but need to do. Racking is essentially siphoning the top clean portion of wine off of the bottom lees. Uh, lees is that sediment that falls to the bottom of vessels. It's normal to rack two to three, two, three, four times throughout the whole winemaking process. Um, you want to rack after pressing. You want to rack after fermentation. If you cold stabilize, which I'll get to in a minute, rack after that. And then just after months of aging, gravity will naturally pull sediment out of solution, just, you know, it, at the bottom of tanks or barrels or carboys. You want to rack, always rack. Lees is not really good. I mean, for the most part, if, if your wine is sitting on lees for months at a time, that's, that's bad news. Um, you want to rack off of lees as much as you can. 
which brings me to Lee's. Lee's, if you didn't know, but I'm sure all of you do know, is the dead yeast, tiny bits of pulp, insoluble solids, macromolecules that just lay at the bottom of the wine vessel. You know, just in the normal winemaking process, Lee's gets developed all the time. And it's, it's similar to coffee dregs. You know, when you make coffee in the morning, you have the leftover spent grounds. That's basically the Lee's of coffee. And Lee's is just, you know, stuff that settles out at the bottom. You always want to rack off of it though. You know, it's a natural thing, natural phenomenon. But get your wine off of Lee's. Okay, cold stabilizing. This is a little bit more advanced now. If you have the chance to control your temperature and let's say you do have glycol cooled tanks, Cold stabilizing your wine is a great way to drop everything out of solution. Um, potassium and tartaric acid will actually form together to form potassium bitartrate, which are those crystals you may have seen. If you put, if you have a bottle of wine and you put them in the fridge and you pull them out later, you're like, what is this crystal that's formed? That's potassium bitartrate. And that's natural. It's nothing wrong, totally natural. Uh, but if you're able, if you can cold stabilize your wine, it will drop all of that out of solution. At the same time, it's also going to affect your pH. Um, no wrong or right, it's just the way it is. Um, it'll potassium increases pH, tartaric acid lowers pH, and so when you drop them both out of solution, it alters your pH a little. Um, and then if you go to add, funny thing, if you add acid after you cold stabilize, you've just kind of destabilized everything you've done. Um, sometimes you have to though, like if, you know, you have to add acid, I've already cold stabilized it, whatever, put more acid into it, maybe do it again, it's, it's okay. Um, so just know cold stabilizing is a thing. And if, and if you've bottled wine and put it in the fridge and you've seen those crystals form, that's what it is. You're, you've cold stabilized after bottle, which is, don't do that, cold stabilize before bottle. Okay, potassium metabisulfite. I hope all of you are using this. KMBS is, is shorthand for it. So potassium metabisulfite is a preservative to protect against oxidation and microbial spoilage. Um, it needs to be used often. Well, it needs to be monitored often and only used when your free SO2 is low. And I'll get to free SO2 in a minute. You add KMBS you know, after pressing, after racking. You can even use it at harvest, I mean, I've done that before. You put it into the must while you're to kind of preserve it. It does inhibit microbes, though. You know, so so it a lot. It takes a lot to kill your your Saccharomyces yeast, um, but just a little bit will will inhibit the wild yeast. So it's okay to use kind of at fermentation if you need. But also know it it slows or inhibits malolactic fermentation. So uh, I'll get to MLF in a minute. Again, KMBS inhibits microbes. Well, microbes are used to make wine. So it's kind of like, you know, you use it in the, in the aging process really a lot. Okay, malolactic fermentation, MLF. This is the conversion of malic acid into lactic acid. And I'm sure some of you know this, if not all of you know this. Malic acid is crisp, like apples, and uh, lactic acid is soft, like milk and butter. This is totally a stylistic choice by you, the winemaker, um, but it's, it's bacteria does this. Lactic acid is one of the few good bacteria in winemaking and um, lactic acid bacteria is used to convert this process. Um, again, potassium, the metabisulfite will inhibit lactic acid bacteria and so it'll delay MLF. If you're going to take your wines through MLF, you know, kind of, Go easy on the KMBS and keep your wine warm. If you do not want to take your wine through MLF, chill your wine, you know, cellar temperature 60, well, maybe colder. 68 is cellar temperature, but keep it around 60. Uh, and then use KMBS to prevent these microbes from forming. Okay, adding oak and tannins. So now we're into like the aging process. You know, the wine has been made, we've sulfided it, we've racked it, we have some steel wine, it looks good. Now we need to age it, add some tannins. Oak aging is a very common thing. Every winemaker in the world does it. For red wine, you can oak whites, very rare exception there, but most part, all reds get oaked. Um, you can use alternatives, which is chips, blocks, spirals, and cubes, or just traditional oak barrels, which is what you see in the top right corner. Tannins 
are, I consider tannins kind of advanced because they're just so many different options to use. Um, and there are different types of tannins. You know, there's condensed tannins, elagitannins, gallic tannins, and, and each one is used at a different stage in the process. So tannins are good to impart mouthfeel, you know, that puckering type dryness sensation. Those are tannins. And oak has tannins, uh, but tannins come from a bunch of different things. I mean, all plants have tannins, essentially. Um, so if you're using tannins in your winemaking, really know your stuff and know what you're using and why you're using it. bulk aging and long-term storage. So your wine is made, let's say it's in oak or sitting on oak and carboys. Now you just want to preserve it. You want to preserve it, monitor it, make sure it's okay. Um, usually the longer you age red wine, the better it becomes. That's usually how it is. Um, oak aging is a common way to do this. And you want to constantly monitor your wine, you know, by chemical analysis or by smelling and tasting and add cambius as needed. Now that's not to say you shouldn't open up a barrel every week. I wouldn't do that, you know, but maybe you can pour some from a tank or check your barrels maybe once a month. So bring me to sparging. I, I, nitrogen gas is a good way to remove oxygen from carboys or tanks or even barrels. Um, you want to top up your tanks, carboys, and barrels. You always want to end a vessel completely full. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner is a carboy with about an inch of headspace. That's perfect. Even less. If you can get down to like a centimeter of headspace, that's even better. You want to remove oxygen all the time. The picture on the right is, you know, that's a that's a good amount of headspace. That's that's not good, but if you have no option but to keep your carboy, like let's say all I have is a five gallon carboy and all I have is three gallons of wine, that's okay. You need to sparge that headspace with nitrogen gas though. You want to remove all the oxygen from that headspace and make, you know, remove the oxygen. Argon gas works better, but it's more expensive, you know, so there's a trade off there. Um, you can use CO2 as well, but I would recommend nitrogen or argon. Filtering. So let's say you're towards the end of the process. You can filter your wine to um, the top right corner, small scale filtering. Bottom right corner is a plate and frame filter. I've, I've used both, but I, I've working commercially, you use plate and frame a lot of the time. Um, different filter pads will filter out different things. They come in various sizes. If you're going to sterile filter your wine and get rid of everything in it, a 0 0.45 micron filter will do that. Chemical analysis. I'm, I'm a big fan of chemical analysis. I think it's essential in winemaking. Um, free SO2. So KMBS increases free SO2 levels. Well, you have how do you check free SO2 levels with chemical analysis? I think checking your free SO2 is one of the most fundamental things you can do as a winemaker. You always need to check your free SO2 levels. The top right corner is oxidation apparatus for or aspiration oxidation apparatus for free SO2. Uh, the top left corner is a volatile, as a cash steel for volatile acidity. You don't have to know how to use these glasswares. They're not that intimidating once you know how to use them. They look big and mean, but they're not. They're, they're very simple. Um, but again, back to the Venmetrica. If you wanted to purchase a Venmetrica, this is a little tool that actually measures your free SO2. And it's almost just as good as the glassware. It, you know, it's if there's a way you can measure free SO2, by any means, do it. Bottling. Okay, so now we're at bottling. Um, you know, bottling, <laughs> bottling should really be done months or even years after red wine is made. I, I was talking to a lady who, you know, was thinking like, oh, I just fermented my, my must and I, I just went straight to bottle. <laughs> no, it's, it's not how it's done. Commercially, red wine is bottled for two years, white wine around one year. And this is also the time to make your final KMBS additions because once it goes in the bottle, you know, that's it. It's out into the public, you know, to be drank. I made like a little timeline for winemaking you can look at coming back to it. Uh, any questions? So that just brings, brings me to the end. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now if I can figure out how. And uh, we'll open it up for a Q&A.
how do I stop sharing screen? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm not the best with technology, it's funny. Well, any, any questions? Sorry, I, I can't hear you. I said, uh, I thought it was pretty straightforward, your uh, uh, discussion so far. Excellent. Thank you. Any, yeah. I mean, that was just a rough basic outline. I mean, that's, that's um, I can really go in depth on any issue you want, but I figured just as a starter, that's a, that's a good starting point. Aaron, this is- Hey, Aaron. Hi, hello. Go ahead, Rick. Oh, uh, just a real quick question. Uh, how long is too long, in your opinion, on storage like red wine? Oh, uh, not almost indefinitely. Now that, okay, that's not true. Um, if the wine was made really well, a decade, you can store it for a decade. If, if it's starting to slip, let's say you're starting to smell, you know, nail polish remover or you're starting to smell rotten eggs then it's, it's on the decline um but I, I you know two to three to four to five years is okay as long as it's stored well and if you're storing it in oak maybe pull it off of oak after two years you know put it in a stainless steel tank so it's inert because the oak will keep imparting tannins it'll keep imparting vanilla it'll keep imparting these flavors and changing the wine so but as long as it's preserved and, and the numbers are okay and there's no faults, you can you can store it for a very long time. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Aaron, this is Oscar. Um, just wondering if there's a way for you to share the presentation. Some of the stuff, I was able to take some notes on things, but it yeah. was kind of any way that you could maybe email out the presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I will do that. I have to find a platform to put it on. Like YouTube is a quick answer, but maybe we can, I don't have like an OSU winemaking page, but I, I will definitely record it and save it and, and share it somehow with you. Okay. Even if it's just a PowerPoint, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll put the PowerPoint in a PDF and, and send it out too. Great. Thank you. Is there anything you're currently experiencing in your winery you have questions about? Hi, Aaron. Um, is there a recommended method for um, measuring alcohol, finished alcohol content? So yeah. an abuleometer, or is there any uh, modern technology that you recommend other than the old fashioned abuleometer? That, that's about it. I mean, the abuleometer is, is what I recommend. Um, I mean, there, there are digital versions of the abuleometer, but it's essentially the same thing. You know, uh, there's also, there is a tiny little thing called a, a venometer. It's, it's spelled V-I-N-O-M-E-T-E-R, but it's not that accurate. I mean, it, it's in the ballpark, but it's not precisely accurate. I don't know of a better way than an old school ebuleometer, truly. Hi, this is uh, Taylor Riggs. I was curious, um, has there ever been a time where you have used fining agents? Maybe if like you're having a hard time with the lease settling before yeah. racking or anything like that? For sure. I, 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 I debated on putting that in here or not. I didn't know if that was advanced or basic. I have um, bentonite and uh, isingloss are two. Um, now, your finding agents are charged one way or another. And I mean, bentonite is negatively charged and isingloss is a protein that's positively charged and they work opposite of one another. So if you're, if you're trying to drop more leaves out of solution, Bentonite can be done that way. I think isinglass really can too, um, but it's just knowing what you're trying to drop out. And I've, I've used bentonite more than anything. I've always used a lot of bentonite. You, it's, it's a clay material, negatively charged. You put it in a bucket, hot water, you kind of whisk it up and you just toss it into your tank and it, and it will just you know go down and pull proteins, leaves out of solution. Uh, so that's one way. Bentonite's a good way to do it. Wonderful, thank you.
Aaron, this is Oscar again. Um, any recommendations for people that are not doing necessarily their, their testing? And they may not be on the call, but I think everybody on the call is fairly advanced, except me. But maybe the kind of for new, for beginners, yeah. Mark is, can't see there, so, okay. Um, yeah. Maybe like a lab or some sort of recommendation to Holy, send. Send them here. I'll do them. Gladly. <laughs> yeah, it's higher level testing and, and really raise the level of winemaking um, as, as a unit, maybe we could. Absolutely. I mean, no, here at OSU, we have an analytical chemistry lab that I have a key to and I, I have access to equipment. Um, I would be glad to. You can send a 50 milliliter sample in and just say, like, contact me so I can, like, walk you through it and you'll be a phone call. If you send in a 50 mil test tube full to the brim, you want to fill up your sample tubes all the way. Again, eliminate headspace. Mail that to me and I'll do any test you want on it. Thank you. For sure. For sure. Yeah, maybe I should have done an advanced wine making, you know, because I I wasn't sure how, because I've spoke to some people and it's like they need fundamental help. But if this audience seems to be more advanced, which is great. You know. Um, you know, dare, dare I try to help with marketing issues? Or are we trying to like, you know, sell wine? I'm, I'm not a marketer, I'm not a salesperson, but I, just seeing the business, you know, pushing product is a, is a, is a part of the business. Um, I, I hope sales are going well. I hope you're finding channels of selling wines too, you know. Um, I hope your red wines are aged and tasty. Can, can Oscar, I, the uh, uh, Aaron showed a picture uh, towards the end of the, the presentation of a device that I've used for several years here, and I love it. It's the Vinmetrica yeah. SC300. It's not very expensive, and you can get some really quality uh, measurements. Uh, sugar, TA, uh, so pH, uh, SO2 measurements. Yeah. Really recommend that to any of the winemakers out there. It's just a great little testing device. Indeed. Yeah. Now, did you say you, you measured sugar with it? No, no, sorry, not sugar. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Just the, yeah. Uh, but everything else. pH, everything else, yeah. all the critical, the pH, TA, uh, SO2. It's, it's, um, it's great. There's, yeah, there's actually a, um, there is an adapter that you can get for it to measure residual sugar. Um, I've, I've got it, never used it, but yeah, yeah, that's okay. Residual sugar is not really one. You, I mean, it's good to know, but it's not necessary. Yeah, I, I agree. The metric of rules, they're, they're good, good, good. May I, may I ask how were, I mean, berry chemistry is your harvest. How, how are the grapes coming in? You know, how's bricks, how's, how's pH? It's always been high in Texas. Like that's where I'm from. Um, pH is common to be in the fours, you know. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. So um, I, we just finished up our last harvest. Um, went through. I worked with four different growers this year. We had seven harvests, um, and in each case. The, the vines were really stressed this year. So harvest came in about a week earlier than they historically had. Um, we had smaller berry size, much more concentrated sure. uh, juices, colors, flavors, everything's more concentrated. Um, uh, because it was a heat stress, not necessarily um, a, a normal year. So bricks actually didn't get as high as normal. So everything was coming in um, 21 to 23 bricks. And um, pH and TA, I, I really pick off of those more than bricks. Yeah. And so those, those were all coming in uh, anywhere from 3, 4 to 3, 5 range. Um, and TA kind of depend on the variety. The lowest TA I had was 6. And that was the last round of Chamberson. Um, but but yet pH was 3.46 on that one. So that, that one was fine, but super, super jammy. I mean, that, that one we hung on as long as possible. Um, and it 
it came out. I, I, it's going to be great. Uh, we're not done fermenting on that one yet, but anyway, that's that's how they performed for me. Just everything was a, at least a week earlier than historically normal. Okay. Good. 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 I'm I'm having to adjust to the, I mean Oklahoma climate. I'm I'm used to growing in Texas where it's a hot. Well, it's been hot here too, but like it, you know, it's hard in the zone eight down there. So it, it takes longer to go into dormancy, and it's bud break is earlier too. And here, I've heard bud break is like April, or, you know, at least can be April. And dormancy starts you know about now to November, and so getting used to that, but not not too much of a a big shift. One of the big stressors we had this year was um, drought. Um, you know, we had, we had a relatively wet spring, and then the the rain just stopped. Uh, so some vineyards, you know, two or three months with no rain. So they were just irrigating at that point. We can only talk about our vineyard, of course, but uh, we were uh, our soil was very sandy and during the peak of the heat, we were watering three times a week, just the short periods of watering, but watering more frequently was one of the uh, tools that we used to try to counteract the uh, intense heat this year. Seemed to do okay. That's good, you survived. <laughs> That's great. The, um, the research vineyard here in Perkins um, is pretty sandy soil and yeah. I'm sure it might be kind of similar. Yeah, our soil is very similar to Perkins. Okay. Sandburrs and everything. That's, yes, that's a lot of that out there as well. Yeah, if you need some more, I can happily get you some, you know, <laughs> 20, 30 pounds, yeah, you know, whatever you want. Yeah. The, the biggest issue we had this year was uh, fruit dropping off prematurely off the plants. I mean, you, you always lose some fruit to, to the animals, I believe. Not that I ever saw them or caught them, but uh, I think a lot of the fruit drop was possibly due to heat stress. Um, we may have a nutrient problem, as I keep whining to anybody that Remote even asked me. Uh, <laughs> uh, that might be an issue. Uh, but other than that, it was it was a pretty it was a pretty good growing year. We had virtually no bugs this year. Yeah. Um, Very few ticks. We virtually had no birds this year. <clears throat> I think the hot weather group kept them in the in the uh, forested areas. I'm, I'm happy to report we had no plant death, deaths mid-season. I usually have a plant die mid-season for whatever particular reason. Didn't have any of that. So it, um, it was a pretty good growing season all in all, I thought. Excellent. Um, anybody else have anything? Maybe just random thoughts. Oh, well, that's um, uh, went a little bit quicker than I anticipated, but that's if uh, if everybody's satisfied with what's going on, you know, so far at least, I guess we can jump off and continue with other things. But again, I'm, I'm glad to be here and I'm very excited to help in any way, shape and form I can. I mean, I don't mind visiting sites at all. I'll come see you and walk through your vineyard, walk through your cellar with you anytime, you know. And then if you, if you just want, you know, sheer chemical analysis done on any wine, call me, and send, mail me a, a sample and I'll, you know, run analysis on it. So. Aaron, do you have any recommendations for those that are just doing kits or maybe making meads or other types of wine? I, um, I, I can't say anything about mead. I, I don't, I've never made mead, nor do I. 
here. Okay. Um, kit kit wine's a great starter. Like it's and it's fun to do. But I mean, I, I think if you're really trying to build a winery, you know, you should you should do grapes. You know, if you're if you're if you're not mm -hmm. planting, at least purchase some. And then you know, it goes back to Oklahoma too. You know, staying within Oklahoma makes Oklahoma grapes make Oklahoma wine. You know. Right. Right. Okay. Were you able to harvest any of the fruit from Perkins, personally? I, other than just for eating, I didn't. I didn't harvest any to make any from wine, but a few clusters, you know, just for fun. There, I, I got here about the time it was it was ready to go, and so quick answer, no, I didn't harvest. But have been looking at the vineyard though, and, and sending it into into post care, you know, into the, the, the post harvest, you know, type of work now. And, Come the come the spring though, uh, I'll give it a pruning, you know, and start start growing for the following year. Is it too late to fertilize right now? If you're going to, I would do it right now, like today and this weekend, and then I wouldn't do it past next week. Um, again, that's just that's just with nitrogen though, in my opinion. Um, low 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 dose of nitrogen. If you're going to put some out, you know. Uh, potassium and and some phosphorus would be would be good. Um, I, even manure, like I've, I've heard of people just putting manure out, and that's fine. But I would do it very soon. I wouldn't wait. I wouldn't wait till October to do it. Uh, well, speaking of next spring, uh, we have discussed this before. We think it would be a good idea to have a let's call it a refresher course in pruning. Sure. Shop. Uh, shop. Okay. Uh, it, might want to think about something like that in the spring. Uh, good idea. Uh, all I was been doing this for a while, but it's always kind of a good idea to sure to recoup what you're thinking. Okay. Yeah. You don't often get an opportunity to watch somebody else prune, and that's the real value. Okay. Yeah. In a different vineyard, different scenario, different kind of grapes. You know, talk about it. Sure. You know, do the finger pointy thing and. Yeah. yeah. Talk to your, your, your cordons and your spurs and your buds. And yeah, yeah. Really. Uh, uh, personally, I I, an annual pruning workshop, I think, would be a great thing. Yeah, we like that idea. I can do that in the spring. I, I, I can even go through and, like, rough prune everything in, like, February or March and then come out. And so, you know, rough pruning is just when you, like, you prune, like, s s 10 inches, yeah, above. And then you go through and you fine prune, I think. I, I could do all, all the rough pruning and then come through with a fine pruning workshop. That would be good. Right, yeah. Right. Harley's typically done rough pruning in January, February. Okay. And well, you can do it slower. Uh, you can also take a little time to tie up different things that need to be tied up. Usually in the spring when you start pruning, it's a time issue and you have to hurry up and get her done. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, the rough pruning, you can kind of take a little more time to assist to do different uh, things yeah. and you also don't rip off the, the new buds by doing your rough right. work, which right. i have ripped off too many oh no buds. <laughs> another thing that um, a bunch of us have been talking about is um the uh, dreaded task of netting and if there's any way to educate or come up with some kind of new method that makes that job Know it. Um, Less, yeah. Um, you know, we might even want to study Mark and Diana's vineyard because yeah. they've come up with an idea that we're going to see how it works uh, longevity. But right now, it looks like it might be a real plus for all of us to learn from. And we did see it, you know, in Texas where they had stored their below the cordon you know and secured it but i've seen that with uh, that's actually hill netting they um oh is that what it is yeah they, oh they, okay they keep hill netting below the cordon and then about july august they just raise it you know for birds yeah huh. ah i is it different than bird netting then hill I, netting i think oh. it is i i i mean it, I think it's a bit thicker, you know, more more sturdy, um, but it, it's essentially works the same. You know, it's just tiny little like bird netting is laced with holes, and hill netting is too. Um, but I think, Holler. yeah, hill netting. Holler. is, Sorry, I heard something about bee netting too. 
I, you know, I joined a, a great girl group that's across the whole country, but they were talking about bee netting, and I guess it's even a smaller hole. Oh, yeah, I've never never dealt with that. Yeah, <laughs> and didn't know it existed either. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Any anything else from anybody? Well, I think it was great success for your very first yeah. Zoom meeting. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And I can I can just um, you know if you have any questions about anything you can email me. It, we're, I'll, I'll just keep putting on you know I'll try to do these every so often maybe once a month or so and I can do one over you know tannins and oak I can do one over. Um, you know, finding. I can do one over even vineyard. Like we can go into the vineyard and talk about anything, anything you want. You know. So. Aaron, I do have one more question. Um, I'm going to be doing something this year that I have not done before. Um, I know other vineyards and wineries do it. This practice, and that is to compost um, all of the the racuses and the all the. Um, Thomas all the pumice yeah and just compost that down and then put that in the vineyard yeah uh, what experiences have you had with that in the past and is there a best practice for that stuff and, and timing what yeah i i've done it once in the past um and it was just like you imagine you just kind of go through and sprinkle it under row um i've getting it incorporated is a different story we we had like a, um, a homemade tool. I, imagine like a a a, a, a handled. It, it was like a, a spear, but it was a hollow spear, and you just punch the ground. With it. Go under each vine and just punch the ground, and it's like you're incorporating. It was homemade, but th again, that's the only time I've ever done that. You, you just you just put it along the rows, and then you go down and you try to punch it in the best you can. Uh, I don't know how well or not well, and you know. I'm sure it helps because it's, you know, it's compost, but um, yeah, I would say just incorporate it somehow. You put that on, we got a bunch maybe of put it on the weaker vines or something is, I don't know what, what does it contain that would help the vine? Man, I mean, it's a lot of potassium. I know that because berries usually contain potassium, but then that always ends up in your wine too. Um, Okay. I mean, between that and like chicken manure, I've done that before too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we've done the horse manure that was well composted. Yeah. That that's a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't I don't know too much about you know the chemical makeup of the elements of what it is. It can't hurt. I, I, I say. Hmm. Yeah. I've I've always been a fan. Of that type of stuff, composting, reuse, natural, you know, um, sustainable, sustainability type stuff. So it gives you something to do with a mountain of uh, of pumice uh, yeah. and, and stems and everything. So I've got a pretty good sized one this year. So. Yes, you do. It's nice to have you on board, uh, Aaron. We're really glad you're here. Yes, yeah. we are. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I love it. I don't know. I got into it when I was 23 and just haven't stopped since. <laughs> I don't know. Exactly what we need here is, is um, you to impart that love of the industry to the to everyone, you know, and, and um, and I know that um, if we can have um, a conference maybe next year or um, our next meeting, hopefully you'll, you'll have time where you can come and meet a lot more people. Sure, yeah, absolutely. We probably need to get together for some wine tasting for yes. uh, analysis purposes. Sure, of course. Of course. Education, <laughs> educational taste, testing and... Um, <laughs> Can, can you educate your suit yourself too much on wine tasting? Not at all. I don't think so. I don't think, I don't so. think you get too much education on that field. 
<laughs> Aaron, have you have you uh, any experience in uh, teaching um, wine appreciation? Oh, not really. I, I've quick answer no. Now, I, I'm I'm I don't know as much sensorily, you know, as 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 maybe I should. I'm I'm definitely a, a winemaker and a wine grower, but um. Yeah, if you're talking like, you know, smell and taste and I mean, I know, right. smells, you know, I, but yeah, your, yeah it, your palate, your palate. It, just, it just takes years to develop a really good palate and I'm building it and just I'm not, I'm not the best. So I'm, I, I mean, I could, I could put on a wine appreciation class, but I'm, there are people who would probably know more than me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the fun artwork side of it. You know, once you have like six or seven or eight different wines made, and just start blending them together, it's like, you know, it's totally artistic at that point. Aside from chemical analysis, it's always every time you blend, you want to analyze again, check a pH, check a pH. You know, that's always important. Oh. Yeah, story about that. Yeah, I still sure haven't learned that one. Yeah. All right. Well, any any final thoughts? Just uh, uh, yeah, thank you. And what what's the next topic? Uh, are you going to have another one next month? I don't know. I'm sure I can. Yeah, I mean, I, I will. I'll put on something else. Um, I'll, I'll just decide later. Or again, if you have an idea, shoot me an email. You know, I'll, I'll make a PowerPoint about it. Or continue. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Well, um, well, okay. Until next time, I'll, I'll send everyone this uh, the PowerPoint too. And then once I find a good platform to post these recordings on, I'll do that. You know, I, I'm thinking maybe I have to create an OSU, you know, analogy yeah. line, you know, YouTube page or something. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Awesome. Awesome. All right, everybody. Well, until next time. All right. Thank you for your Thanks, time. Sir. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.